Okay, so we've been talking about essential biodiversity variables. And Town already introduced three of those classes of essential biodiversity variables. He talked to us about genetic composition, he talked to us about species populations, and he talked to us about community composition. Um, and today I'm going to talk to you about species traits. But just a, a bit of a review. So there's six what we call classes of essential biodiversity variables. So these are sort of broad scale classifications or categories of essential biodiversity variables. So genetic composition is one of these broad scale classes. Species populations is another broad scale class. And then what uh, the community has done with regard to essential biodiversity variables is within each of these classes, there's a number of specific variables that they've actually highlighted. So in total, there are actually 22 essential biodiversity variables that have been highlighted by this group. And I'm going to talk to you about species traits. So what is species traits in this framework of essential biodiversity variables? Essentially, species traits are just to the point of species traits is to monitor how organisms are responding to global change. And the thing to remember is that species traits are focusing mostly on the traits of species or intraspecific trait variation. So that means within a species or at the species level. So this is not across species. Um, that would be community composition, so that would be something like town talked about. This is at the species level or, or within um, an individual species. And what you can see here, um, this is what uh, this group Kissling et al. have written about. Species traits can be quantified by measuring characteristics of individuals. So things like timing of flowering, body lengths of fish, stem heights, diameters of tree individuals, even things like chemical chemistry, so leaf nitrogen and chlorophyll content. Or you can measure parts of individuals, so an area of an individual leaf. So those are the types of traits that we're talking about when we're referring to species traits in an EBV context. And the reason that I say in an EBV context is because uh, these sorts of variables, and we'll see this in, uh, on the next slide, they're really meant to monitor how species respond to change and how species are responding to <laughs> human or sort of environmental pressures over time. Um, and the reason, remember, that EBVs are so important and that we're learning about them is because they're supposed to serve as this interface between sort of primary biodiversity data and policy and decision making. So the point of EBVs is we can make these measurements, so we can look at genetic composition, we can look at these species traits, we can look at uh, population structure, and we can then take measurement data, take, quantify those traits, and apply them to conservation decisions, apply them to management decisions. So they're supposed to serve as this kind of uh, data product that you can then um, bring to decision and policy makers. So, I said that species traits are this broad EBV class. What are the specific variables in this broad class? And there are um, six of them. No, seven of them. So these, there is phenology, morphology, reproduction, physiology, and movement. So five of them. Um, and let's discuss what each of these are. So, phenology, who knows, who, who can tell me what that means? Yeah. Yeah, I, I think phenology means the external features of a species that can help to identify it. Or to so, um, that is actually morphology, and we'll get there in a second. Any other guesses? Yeah, Jesse. Uh, phenology is when you look at either plants or biological life cycle of events. When does it seed? When does this kind of characteristics? 
good. So that's right. So phenology means the timing of biological events. So for example, when are plants flowering? When are plants going to seed? When are birds migrating? What's the timing of those events? So that is what phenology means. And in this picture here, you see sort of this tree with yellow leaves, right? So the timing, if we're in sort of temperate areas or even here um, with trees that drop their leaves, for example, during the dry season, when, what's the timing of that event? So that's what phenology means. So morphology, you, you already said this, right? So morphology means what does an organism look like? What is the sort of shape or size of an organism? So that's what morphology means. So we can say that um, this dragonfly has a specific morphology. It has these two lace-like wings. It has this long, slender, cylindrical body. That's all part of its morphology. So things like size, shape, etc. So reproduction, that should be fairly straightforward, right? So reproduction, we can think about uh, what sort of things can we think about when we refer to reproduction? What kind of specific uh, traits can we measure with regard to reproduction? Yeah, Franklin. Yeah, uh, about reproduction, we may look first, which is the ability of a species to have kites or offspring, and how it may reproduce over time. Means you may observe during which time this organism may have kites or may have offspring. Good, so how many times uh, a year does it, uh, an organism have offspring, right? So that's, that's a really key thing that we can look at with regard to reproduction. What are some other traits? Jesse? Litter size. Litter size, exactly. So how many offspring does an individual organism have? And that can vary, of course, within a species, but of, of course also across species. Other things that we can think about? Fertility. Fertility, yeah. So, um, you know, I, that sort of ties in with how many, um, how often, but we can also think about the timing. So, you know, what time of year? Maybe they only have it, have offspring one time a year, but different species might have it at different times of the year. So sometimes in the fall versus other times in the spring, for example. The mating behavior. Mating behavior, that's excellent. Exactly, R mating behavior. So what are the types of behaviors that um, an individual needs to do or a species needs to do in order to reproduce? And what kind of structures do they need for that reproduction, for example? Exactly. Gestation period. Gestation period, also really key. So how long does it take once they mate um, and are inseminated for them to actually have their offspring? Good. Okay, so then physiology. What about, what, what is physiology? So physiology is like the, the functioning of the, the body, of the system. Good, it's like the functioning of the system. So what is the, sort of the chemistry um, that an organism requires to actually um, metabolize and to function? And so some of the traits that we can think about with regard to physiology are things like thermal tolerance, right? So what are the temperature conditions at which a species uh, lives, for example, right? Um, what's the chlorophyll content of a leaf of a plant? So those are things that we would care about with regard to physiology. And then movement is pretty easy, right? Everybody should get an idea of what movement means. So how far does um, an individual disperse once they're born? So that's something that we can look at with regard to movement, for example. Um, we can also think about sort of um, uh, timing like dispersal pathways so do they take specific uh, pathways when they're moving about so that's something else that we can think about do they move in groups um, or are they do they move as individuals so as alone for example so there's a lot of different variables that we can also think about with regard to movement um, and including sort of migrate migration and migratory pathways Okay, so one of the things to think about 
with regard to species trait EBVs is that when we're collecting data on these uh, species traits, we really need to know um, both the time that the that data was collected and the location at which that data was collected. So if you think about this, if we're looking at um, a specimen record in a museum, so let's say you have this beautiful specimen um, of, of, um, of a plant in a herbarium um, that is, is in flower, right? It's a pressed specimen and it has this beautiful flower and uh, you know it was collected in 1920, let's say, and in Malawi. So, but that's all the information we have. We know it was in Malawi, we know it was collected in 1920, but that's all the information that we have on that specimen. How, how useful is that specimen? I would argue that it's not very useful. And that's because we don't know specifically where it was collected in Malawi. So what sort of environment and habitat is it, where, uh, is it from? And we actually don't know when that uh, plant was flowering in 1920. Maybe it was flowering at a different time that it flowers now. But actually we don't have any knowledge about that because we don't know the date at which it was collected. We don't know if it was collected in September or in October or in January, for example. So when we're thinking about collecting um, and analyzing these uh, species trait data, we really need to know when the data was collected and where it was collected in the world. And this actually goes for pretty much all data. <laughs> um, but it's specifically true when you're trying to look at how species are responding to human pressures as well as um, environmental pressures. Okay, so we're talking about these EBVs, we're talking here specifically about species traits, but why do we really care about this? Why do we care about measuring these species traits that we just talked about, right? The phenology, morphology, movement, physiology, why do we, why do we care about that? Why are they useful? Can you guys think of some ideas? Yeah. First of all, I think uh, this is first an issue of uh, uh, conservation. So we are trying to know more about the species so that we can be able to, to conserve it. And uh, a few days ago, we talked about uh, uh, a species which uh, was uh, stressed because people collect this back a lot. Mm -hmm. so we notice that uh, the species no more flourish. So by monitoring those variables, we may see and analyze how we can manage to make the species flower again. Exactly. So, ba so what he said essentially is that it's important for conservation. So if we are measuring these particular traits through time, we can notice if a species is in decline, for example, or we can notice if there are issues with managing a population, and then we can enact uh, particular policies for uh, conservation purposes. And so a great example of what you just said um, is actually with regard to food resources, for example. Um, so we could actually uh, let's say in, in the lakes here in Rwanda, measure the fish that we're catching from those lakes, from those natural populations. So when, when the fishermen catch the fish from those lakes, we can measure the size of, of those fish. And if we're doing this over time, for example, especially over decades, we can get an idea of sort of how that, that fish population is changing through time. Is it, are we sustaining sort of the, uh, the distribution of sizes? Are we still catching large fish? Or is the fish population declining and we are getting smaller and smaller fish or, or fewer fish, for example? Um, <coughs> and then we can actually sort of make decisions about uh, how to manage those fish populations. So if we were interested in measuring um, fish size, What's that an example of? So which one of these is that an example of? Morphology, right? So what the organism looks like. How, in this case, how long it is or how big it is. Um, and there's an, an, a cool example of this. Um, in this paper here, 
um, Genner et al. in Global Change Biology. And what they were doing was they did a really long-term study. So from 1911 to 2007, they were actually looking at demer the demersal fish assemblage. So demersal just means sort of bottom dwelling or bottom feeding fish. And they were looking at these fish in the Western English Channel. So uh, where, where I live right now, off where I live, um, between um, Europe and uh, England. Um, and what they were doing was they were measuring these, uh, the size of these fish through time. Um, and what they found was that the larger fish species, so the ones presumably that humans were catching uh, for food most often, had a really significant decline um, from, say, 1950 to, when they, to 2007, when they finished collecting this data. And they were making a bunch of inferences or, or sort of assumptions about this in the sense that humans were overfishing these large fish and reducing the size of uh, the fish that they were uh, collecting over the last couple decades. Um, and so you could actually take this sort of study and, and, and take it to managers and say, okay, you know, this is a problem. Maybe we need to sort of um, manage these fish populations better, for example. So why else might we care about measuring these species traits? Um, we can get in a sense the the previous example about fish was sort of human influence, right? So wh what are we doing to our natural food resources, for example? How are humans um, impacting natural populations and natural species? Um, but we can also get a sense of how environmental change, so maybe climate change, are influencing populations and species as well. So we can um, measure, for example, changes in timing of bird egg laying. We can measure changes in phytoplankton population peaks. We can measure changes in when plants are leafing, when plants are flowering, when they're fruiting. And this can give us an idea of how climate change is affecting populations and affecting species. And we can then take this information and project it into the future and think about what sort of changes might, might we expect. And this, of course, to bring it back to this human-centric focus of EBVs, can be useful in terms of saying, okay, well, when do we expect this fruit to, to, uh, to come, right, to be ready? And how does that affect how humans are interfacing with the environment, for example? So these examples here, so this bird egg laying, phytoplankton population peaks, plant leafing, flowering, fruiting, what are these examples of? Phenology, exactly. Changes in the timing of when organisms are doing things in the environment. Um, and then we can also uh, look at movement, right? So again, this is sort of responses of organisms to env the environment and environmental change. So how far do species or individuals disperse? What are the dispersal pathways? What's the home range of a species? So this means um, how far does an individual um, species or organism um, move throughout its lifetime? And we can look at the changes in these specific traits in response to either human pressure or environmental change like climate change. And the whole point, right, it, in terms of quantifying changes in these variables through time is then to get that data and say, okay, do we need to manage this? Do we need to go to policy makers and decision makers and implement um, um, decisions or, or new uh, laws to better manage our natural resources? So these are just some examples that I put on these slides, which you'll get so you can um, uh, have them for your, for your own data. Um, and so this is phenology. So remember the timing in uh, the activities of organisms. So we've already discussed this, but timing of breeding, flowering, fruiting, emergence, host infection. So that's something really interesting that we can think about here in Africa. Um, so, you know, uh, is there a certain time of year that uh, people are becoming infected with a certain disease? And is that changing through time, for example, as climate is changing? Um, and then this is this temporal sensitivity is saying what's sort of the time scale on which we measure these variables, right? And when we're thinking about 
plants fruiting or flowering, or when we're thinking about um, organisms having offspring, so reproducing, usually that's on a, a yearly scale. Not always, but usually it's on a yearly scale. And it can be shorter for some organisms as well. And then this feasibility is sort of just saying, um, what, what is already being done to measure these species traits? And um, what data are available out there? And what you're gonna see in these slides, and Town has uh, reiterated this and, and discussed this in the past, is that actually these data aren't global and they should be global. And these data are primarily focused on the United States and on Europe. Um, there are some global databases, and I'll show you that at the end of this presentation, but most of the time you're going to see that this is primarily focused in the northern hemisphere in places like North America and Europe. Okay, so morphology, that's what the organism looks like. We've already, again, discussed some examples, but you can think of things like volume, mass, and height of an organism or species, the shape and physical attributes, so plant height, cell volume even, right? So it can get very small. Um, leaf area, wing length, color, so what color is an organism, and is the color changing through time? And then when we think about temporal sensitivity, so how are you measuring these? It's you know anywhere from what, what they say one to five years. And of course there's wiggle room in this, right? So you can be measuring these traits in a snapshot of time, but you might want to look at it over a longer period of time as well. Um, we have selected species being uh, measured for sort of body size, especially marine fish. So the example that I showed you before of how marine fish are changing in body size through time, 